Hello, everybody. Thank you for being here with us today. Uh, we're going to speak a bit about sales. Uh, some of you had a chance to talk to Anastasia and Ivan about uh, ensuring a constant customer's flow, right? Uh, I dare say we should call it technically ensuring potential customer's request flow. And now we are going to talk about converting these requests into actual customers. So I believe we should treat both these sessions as a part of the whole. Well, uh, you got a request. Imagine you got a request from a potential customer. It goes something like, I would like to implement a telematic solution. Please send me the prices. Uh, what are you going to do next, guys? Excuse me? Don't send him the price. Good one. But this is what you won't do. But I'd like to hear what you're going to do. Ask for specs. Requirements. Excuse me? <laughs> Good answer. Well, what I believe you should do next is to make a certain preliminary research on your potential customer, to check uh, his company website, to check social networks, to check yellow papers. Uh, actually, any source of information available for you to get to know him, to know his company, his business, his business sphere. This one thing. Another thing I believe you should do is to check whether your company had an experience of dealing with this particular customer before. And if you had such an experience, what request was, what solutions were offered, and what decisions made and why. And this is not all too. Uh, another thing I'd like you to do is to check whether you had an experience of dealing with this customer type, with customers from this particular business sphere. And if you had such an experience, it might be good before the first contact to refresh business issues they usually have and solutions that might be in place for them. Well, gentlemen, uh, why are we doing all this? Who can tell? Yes, certainly it's information, but why would we need it? Yes, excellent, thank you. Very good too. Well, uh, I elaborate a little bit here, and in order to answer this question right, I'll put another one. Uh, guys, uh, what is it we sell actually? What we sell usually? What do you sell to your customers? Service. Excellent. Yes. Yes, right. And what is the difference between selling a service and selling a product? Yes, exactly. Yes. Selling a service, you sell something your customer can touch and has no means of evaluating it before he actually starts receiving it, right? So selling a service, essentially, you are selling yourself as a company, as someone who customer can trust. And to achieve this, being a total stranger to him, he is to you and you to him are complete strangers and you don't know him. So what actually we are trying to do here, we are getting to know him. We are getting to know him in order uh, to him to get an impression you know what you are talking about during the first contact. And so if we uh, made this part right, we already, before the first contact, we know what company we are dealing with. We know their business sphere. Uh, we can get a certain impression on uh, issues they might be facing. And then, they, yes, we can make a first contact. 
Well, uh, our first contact uh, has three main objectives. In fact, four. The first one goes without selling, not to spoil it from the very beginning. It's an important one. And then what we need to achieve, we need to establish first personal contact with them to make a meeting arrangement and maybe start requirements gathering. Uh, though this might be postponed till the meeting itself. Uh, there are generally two ways to establish this first contact. We can call or we can send an email. In different cultures it works different. Uh, in Russia, for example, calls are better. But even if call is the best way to establish a contact, calling without uh, arrangement might be not the best idea because imagine you call him, he's busy, asks you to call later, you call later, he's busy again and again and again and already you just wasting his time without any benefits and well this is not a kind of a first impression you would like to have, right? So I recommend to arrange your first call through email. Uh, so, the call. Mm -hmm. Pardon. Yes, uh, as you noticed, I stated our first objective not to spoil it. Uh, let us see the situation again. We sell service, so essentially we sell yourself, so we need to make a good impression. Uh, while you are calling someone, he can see you, yes but he will have a very good mental picture of you quite soon from the way what you talk and how you do it. And we need him to get this picture right, so we need to talk right. Uh, I believe some of you have seen this movie. Do you know this man? Uh, yes, it's Leonardo DiCaprio, but this is a picture from Wolf of Wall Street movie. Uh, have uh, anyone seen that movie? Please raise your hand. Well, quite a lot. And maybe, maybe some of you know that this is uh, actually sort of documentary. And real Jordan Belfort exists. And this is the guy who knows a bit about selling and about calls in particular. Uh, I personally like how Jordan states uh, formulates good features of the phone call. According to Jordan, you got to be enthusiastic, sharp, and sound like a figure of authority. Uh, let us elaborate a little bit. Uh, let's take a moment and think again. Uh, your customer sent you a request for a reason. He's probably got something going wrong and he's looking for someone to fix it. So what you need to make an impression of someone who is able and willing to get this done for him. And uh, you need to make an impression of someone who actually can get things done. And that's why we need this authority. Also, yes, we are willing and we are actually a kind of a businessman, right? Uh, important note here, a person in charge for making a call, a person on the forefront in the direct communication with the customer, uh, got to have certain authority, certain authority to make decision and certain autonomy. Uh, without that, he won't uh, have a right aura, he won't sound like someone who can actually act and make something. Uh, well, and, one moment, again. Aha, uh -huh, yes. Uh, so, uh, otherwise, he won't sound right and won't make a uh, right impression. There are uh, certain common mistakes on this uh, stage. Sending a price first, actually one of them, and my favorite one. Uh, imagine uh, somebody asks you about your prices, you send the prices and communication stopped completely. Your customer won't answer and you can't touch him. Uh, is this situation familiar to you? 
A very quiet yeses all around the house. Yes. Uh, where's the mistake here? What's wrong? Milan, what's wrong? Why sending price first is bad move? Is it bad? Exactly. As I told you yesterday, we should switch. I'll make your presentation and you'll make, make mine. <laughs> That's why I'm here and you're there, right? Uh, yes, uh, as we are selling a service, and your customer doesn't know you yet. He doesn't know what your offer consists of, so he has no ways of actually estimate whether your price good or not. So uh, sending him the price that way, you just depriving yourself of possibility to influence his decision. And what he gonna do? He's just going to compare certain positions in your price with same positions someone else has and he's gonna choose the cheapest one. If this cheapest one is you, then you're lucky. Well, at least uh, <laughs> till he finds someone else with even lower prices, right? Or maybe, and more uh, probably, he'll go with someone uh, who uh, will make this job right and will provide him real value for the money. And in this case, price doesn't matter that much because he's gonna get a result. Uh, second one might look uh, weird for some, but we actually see uh, this happen uh, quite often. Uh, yourself or your manager uh, might decide that this particular customer isn't serious enough or asking something you don't sell or just don't have some, doesn't have enough new vehicles, right? Mm, well, qualification is an important part of our job. It's true, uh, we should spend our time and resource wisely uh, in order to work on deals uh, which are closable. True, but this decision uh, got to be made wisely too. Uh, I'll put a quick example here. Uh, for example, quite often we get requests uh, from companies uh, looking to buy GPS hardware which we don't sell, but it understood they get the impression we sell it from our website. Yes, we don't sell hardware, but we know if company is looking for GPS hardware, maybe, just maybe, they need software too. And this request, it's a good request for one of our partners, so we forward this request to our partners to work. Uh, also, uh, I'll put another example here, which I believe will illustrate my point. This is a true story. Uh, recently, we got a request from company to connect five units to Vialon. Five. Uh, some of our partners, I know personally, wouldn't even bother to answer. That's not a big amount. But uh, this same preliminary research I just told you about showed that this company actually owns a fleet of 800. Now, this is a bit more interesting amount, yep? And uh, the request to connect five units, five units was made in order to test system, in order to choose a system to migrate from the current one. All this was done through this analysis and through contact with customer. But again, when someone sees five units, well, okay, maybe one day I'll write to him. The moral is simple. Uh, decisions uh, got to be made wisely and after proper analysis and research. Research is very important. Okay, now, pardon. Uh, we made our homework, we have an understanding of whom we are going to meet and we arranged a meeting. Our meeting again has three main objectives. In fact, again, it's four. And the first one, not to spoil it. And here in the meeting, your customer is going to see you. And again, remember, we sell service. So actually the face of our service 
the person who is going to meet a customer. Uh, and here everything matters. The way he look, the way he talk, uh, his manner, what he's wearing. Actually, we all wear, tend to wear smart casual these days, but it would do no harm to check through social network uh, how actually your customer, person you're going to meet, what he wears on a daily basis in order to get an impression what to wear yourself. But even more than your clothes matters your general style and manner. You get to be confident, open-minded, and interested. Uh, depending on your structure, on your team structure, you can have two persons uh, with you on the meeting, a uh, technical guy and sales guy. Uh, maybe it's like two in one in your case, but from my personal experience, if from customer side they have two or more people, it's better not to be alone too. Uh, also, uh, sometimes uh, it works best to have your technical guy communicating with their technical guy or, for example, your accountant talk to their accountant. Professional colleagues usually understand each other better than just your sales communicating with their technical guy. They don't understand nothing from each other. Uh, you should have a short presentation with yourself, with you, uh, during the meeting. Uh, highly desirable this presentation to be specifically made for this particular case, for this particular customer, uh, containing uh, relevant experience and if you have relevant practical cases for this particular case, for this particular uh, customer. Uh, if you don't have such an experience, uh, please uh, remember that you are not alone. You have us and our partners by your side. And it is most likely that some of other partners had such an experience and we can provide you with necessary information. So you'll be able to include into your presentation uh, some case with we alone in this particular business sphere. Also, uh, you can use ready-made presentation on gurtam.com. This presentation can be modified for you by our specialists, or uh, you can get them in PowerPoint in order to modify them yourself. Uh, pardon. Yep, 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 yep. So, uh, after this presentation and, uh, well, some discussions, uh, it's time to proceed to requirements, gathering, and definition. Uh, well, it's a crucial phase, we all understand that, and here, uh, well, you should be as detailed and as systematic as you can. Uh, you, uh, I'll put another example, you work like actually a doctor like a doctor examining patient, interviewing your patient in order to make diagnosis and in order to prescribe treatment. Uh, if, for example, you are dealing with fuel overconsumption, you got to know what types of vehicles they have, uh, the amount, uh, current uh, average fuel consumption, current average mileage, uh, where they ride in a city or by highway, for example. Do they have a need for idling? How often they idle? Everything you can get. Also, it's good to systematize the spheres you are getting information in. And the main thing you need to get, what your customer actually is seeks as a result what it is he's going to solve, what, what the issue he's going to solve, and what the result is. Uh, all this will help us greatly to provide a proper solution for him. But what's important here, it will help us to make him an offer he can't refuse. We'll talk more on it later. As a result of this stage, uh, we must have excellent understanding of their business. Uh, issues they face, tasks they need to be done. And the other important part, we need to establish trust. We need to have good 
uh, relations with them when we part. Uh, also important now here, uh, it's very important to uh, summarize and to confirm all things we came to during our meeting through email uh, in order to make sure we are on the same page and starting to work on actually right tasks. That's understood, right? Uh, and another important thing to make sure your mail received. Just short call or short email in a couple of days, Mr. Smith, I sent you an email. Please kindly check if we got everything right. That will do. So now we got our requirements and it's time to develop a solution. Uh, it's possible that everything you find out and all the requirements fit perfectly in your current offer and it's some kind of standard solution for you, so you will have no problem dealing with it and offering some solution to a customer. But if uh, it's something entirely new for you, again, please remember you've got us by your side and got all partner community by your side. Uh, we got specialists whose daily job is to analyze such a tasks and to provide uh, best solutions or best approaches how to deal with this particular task. Also, we can advise some other partner who has relevant experience and can help. And another thing, if for example, some uh, custom uh, development is required, some custom solution, we can advise partner uh, who can develop such a solution. And well, uh, now you have understanding on how to deal with this request. You have understanding on your pricing too. And it's time to make an offer and uh, to close a deal. And here, uh, let us, uh, before we start, let us make a couple steps back and uh, recall what actually your customer is, uh, what he's looking for. Uh, what he essentially is seeking to get as a result. Who can answer me? Sergey. Oh, Milan. I knew you. Solution of a problem. Good one. Another ideas? Yep, 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 yep. Uh, Actually, he doesn't want to buy anything. He doesn't need GPS hardware. He doesn't need telematic system. Uh, he's got something going wrong. Maybe he's losing money through fuel overconsumption. Or maybe he doesn't earn enough money uh, through ineffective operation with customer requests. Uh, so he needs a result. And if you uh, made all requirements uh, government right, uh, you have a pretty good impression on uh, what actually uh, his experience is experiencing from financial standpoint. So you can see, actually you can have an impression of his financial losses. And also uh, you have a good impression on, on what, he, well, what he is going to receive as a result from financial, again financial standpoint. So uh, you can uh, provide him your offer, showing him the financial losses, showing him the result he's going to get. And so your pricing, uh, which you make in the end, won't look that significant in comparison. Uh, later I'll put a quick example on this. Uh, this offer is better to be presented in a meeting too, in order to for you to present it in person, to convince. And all this uh, leads us to uh, objections handling. And we'll talk about it now. Uh, so uh, what are the common objections you usually meet offering the solutions? Thank you, Anastasia, M my favorite one. Uh, do you agree or something uh, entirely? 
just for video streaming it was too expensive yeah could you too please expensive. repeat yeah could ah, you please so repeat after the after everyone who is speaking from the uh, from the audience repeat just once again to in the microphone for video streaming it's too expensive <laughs> everyone just you know crying it's too expensive too expensive uh, is it good thank you so yes uh, and this uh, actually the most common objection, but uh, as I already, uh, as we discussed earlier, our offer contains uh, vivid, convincing and measurable result. And this result should talk for itself if everything done right. And so uh, let's uh, put a simple example here. Uh, pardon? Yes. No. Here we, we already discussed this. And here's an example. And uh, this is uh, average uh, numbers from Russia. So a uh, heavy track uh, with average mileage around uh, 100,000, 120,000 kilometers per year uh, consumes around uh, 35K liters uh, of diesel per year. Uh, which in Russia costs around $17,000. Uh, in your countries it may be different, but I believe it still costs some money, right? Uh, well, uh, average economy uh, through implementation of our solution, well, it tends to be uh, different time to time, but uh, I'd say it's minimum 10% in average. Uh, sometimes it's much, much more, uh, but rarely it's less. So 10% is uh, around 1700 per year, right? Uh, how much do you charge in your countries for equipping one truck with FLS and a tracker? In Russia, numbers are on the picture. So uh, as you can see, in comparison, well, it's not that big amount to lose on one track, right? But the economy is rather good. So this how it is better to deal with objection on expensiveness of your solution. But uh, there are other one, your rival offer the same solution but cheaper. Well, uh, if you uh, walked carefully through all the stages we discussed, uh, you get a ready-made solution developed specifically for this customer and which fix, uh, fits his business needs. In order to offer the same, your rival should do the same. And if he did it, he won't be that cheap. But if he's cheaper, maybe it's not the same. Uh, quick example, bicycle and automobile are the means of transport, both. Are they the same? I believe not. Difference is in details. Uh, another one uh, objection, your customer in this particular moment doesn't have enough money to implement a solution. Well, I dare say that uh, if without implementing telematic solution, he won't have enough money, he will never have enough money. Uh, because uh, expense on this, expense on telematic solutions, I'd say it's not an expense, it's an investment and an investment of this rare type uh, which returns all this and with interest and quite fast as we can see here. Uh, one moment. Here it's actually two months and this is a real case. Uh, I'd put another example by the way. Uh, one of our partners from Ukraine uh, posted in Facebook a uh, case where they uh, managed to uh, save 5,000 uh, liters of diesel per one vehicles for their customer. 5,000 uh, liters of diesel. How, how much would it cost in Serbia, Milan? 5,000 liters. 5,000 per year. That's good. 
And how much do you charge for one FLS and one tracker to be installed? That's it. So actually, this is really an offer you can't refuse. Guys, you should send like 10,000 monthly. OK. Uh, so what's next? Actually, we made it all done, right? And now we have two ways of situation development. Either deal is closed or not. Uh, both cases, actually, I'd like to state that both cases aren't the end of the story. There's a lot of things to do in both cases, and we'll talk about it right now. Uh, let's start with a uh, situation when deal is closed. Well, uh, congratulations, you won. And what's important here, you are not only sold something, you sold the solution, you closed the deal, you earned customer's trust. And this is very important. Uh, what you got to do now is uh, proceed on building this relation. Uh, your main task is not just to close one deal, but to become a trusted expert in your field of expertise. So in case your customer needs something else, you will be the first person to talk to. And this is important, and this is how we uh, approach it. First thing, I believe you should have a dedicated person for, uh, in charge for communication with this particular customer in order to have them uh, to have uh, trusted relationships between each other. Uh, his daily job uh, going to be, uh, <sighs> pardon, <laughs> I'll have a drink of tea here. So uh, his daily job is going to be uh, trying to understand the business of your, this customer, uh, trying to find uh, ways to help him in order to provide additional value and to make some money for you. Because uh, rarely you can close everything your customer needs in one deal. Company owning a fleet usually faces lots of issues where we are long applicable and can help to improve the results of your customer's business. So your job is to find out such cases, offer solutions and uh, help them. Uh, what uh, else you need? Uh, yes, a person, certainly a CRM profile of your customer where you track everything what's happening, his requests, solutions offered, uh, actually all operation with your customer to have it as a long history in order to sometimes come back and maybe offer something which wasn't good uh, at that time or that you can offer now. Uh, and uh, yes, actually, we can call it upsetting. Uh, another case, uh, somehow your customer refused. How could he? We made everything right, but he refused. Well, it's not a good news uh, we hope to get, but it's not the end of the world either. Uh, and it's quite possible that uh, we win in the end anyway. Uh, in order to do that, you got to stay in touch with him and got to try to be updated on how things are going. Because uh, you see, uh, all, all we are discussing here is actually working with information. No more, no less. You, it all started uh, with you uh, getting some information about some company uh, required telematic solution or losing money or something. You proceeded gathering more information about this company, about its business, right? Then you informed them on your ability to solve their issues. And now you just got another piece of information that in that particular moment they don't need you. 
but information tend to be outdated. It has an expiration date. And this is how you need to treat it. It's not a final refusal, it's just an information. And it's highly possible that this customer will get back to you. I've seen it many times actually, because it's possible that this, uh, let's say, cheap rival or something uh, wasn't that successful in solving customers' issues. They wasn't satisfied with their service. And what you need to do is stay updated and be in right place and right time in order to make your offer one more time. So keep calm and keep trying and it will come to you. Uh, well, uh, there's a couple of common issues which I'd like to discuss too. Uh, test one, again, it's my favorite one. We see it very often. Uh, almost on any stage of this process, your customer might stop answering you. It can happen uh, when you send your first email, uh, arranging your first call. You might not get an answer for that. Or it may happen after your meeting where you presented your excellent offer and they just disappeared after that. And you send him an email with no reply. You call him, he's out of uh, coverage or just won't talk with you and constantly he's busy. Uh, and uh, in our daily job in Russian market, we provide lots tons of requests of potential customers to our partners. Well, because we are quite big in Russia and we get lots of requests of these customers. And I see how our partners work with this request and very often I hear or read in letters explanations like, I wrote him one letter, he didn't answer. I called him, he's busy. I believe he doesn't need solution. Why wouldn't I bother him? Why would I bother myself? He doesn't need nothing. Well, biggest mistake uh, one can make here is to stop trying to get in contact. There are thousands of possible reasons he's not answering and most of them have to do nothing with you. He's got tons of problems of himself and that's why he stopped answering. Uh, again, uh, most of these reasons are temporary. So what you need to do, keep calm and keep trying. Uh, don't be intrusive, that's understood. Also, uh, it might be good to check your uh, communication history with this particular customer to see uh, what means of communication work best. And sometimes it helps to get an answer. Uh, also, please don't copy paste your emails. Uh, imagine he reads them all and how would you look like? Because again, uh, these emails to get in contact, this is all, uh, yes, this is an email to get in contact, but again, this is uh, your email to make a good impression, which we started with, right? and the quality of your communication is actually a key to your success here. So keep that in mind while trying to contact him in any way. Uh, another issue, well, uh, maybe not that common like this one, but I'd like to elaborate a little bit. Uh, we all uh, like to have uh, like big brands among our customers like, I don't know, Coca-Cola, Bank of America, you name it. Uh, yes, uh, this deal is kind of a lifetime deal. It may be something which allow you to make a lot of money for one contract and it's very important from marketing standpoint. Yes, to show your customers that you work with, let's say, Coca-Cola is great, absolutely, but uh, these companies, they understand that too, and they know how to use it. And that's why we often see uh, projects with strict requirements, with ultra-strict budgets, 
And on the test approach, it looks like a good opportunity to work with someone big. But essentially, when you look closer, it's an offer to work for money till the rest of your days. And this may be a deal you should avoid. And it's uh, better to see it beforehand. Uh, and again, if you made a good impression here for such a company, it's quite possible that they will get back to you themselves. It's possible. And then you're going to be not uh, someone working for food, but uh, an expensive expert providing real value and the one treated with respect. That's the way to work with such a customer. So, uh, I believe uh, that's it. We covered uh, basic stages of uh, sales process in telematics. Uh, it's rather, I'd say, a sketchy uh, review, but I hope that maybe these methods and ideas uh, would be useful for some of you. Also, uh, if you find time to share some feedback with me on what was good or maybe what wasn't that good here, I'd be grateful. Or maybe some of you would like to present something yourself, Milan, on the next telematics. I believe uh, many of you have something to say on these issues and lots of other issues, so that would be great too. With that, thank you, and I'm ready for questions, if there are some. Thank you, Dennis. Mr. Samir has a question. Thank you, Dennis. I just want to add one important note about your last slide. Don't lose hope. I, I mean, I'm focusing on the issue you said. The client is not replying. He's not replying to my calls. There is a study. We can apply it to our segment, our market. 10% of the sales lead may be uh, closed by the first or second call. However, 80% closed after the sixth call. Call could be a visit, an email, or a phone call. Don't lose hope. People change, circumstances change, technology, prices, needs change. So I just want to add this point to you. Thank you, Dennis, again. Thank you, Samir. Excellent point. Uh, actually, I'd say that uh, potential customer answering fast is uh, not a common practice. It's like a rare luck. And most of our deals are closing after dozens of emails without reply and after a month. And this is common practice. So one email is just nothing. Any more questions? Yeah, feel free to ask. So I, I just have an observation actually that, that resonates with the, with the point that Dennis made um, in the beginning of the presentation regarding uh, selling product versus, versus selling a service. So we've had a lot of um, uh, cases in, in North American market where uh, the, 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 the companies or entrepreneurs get into the business with the, with the mindset uh, that they used and were really successful selling some type of product, right? Which is a one type, you know, one time sale, and after that, they on to the next sale, right? And and it's this cycle of of selling and moving on, sale and moving on, right? So there are quite a few cases that we had that, um, you know, those those companies failed very quickly, right? So having that mindset. And you know, being aware of that mindset as, as you get into the telematic space is very important. Obviously, you, you guys all here, so you've, you've had some success, I imagine, with, with Wheelon, and, and you don't approach uh, your, your sales in the, in the same way. But I think many of you are also either uh, contemplating or already starting to think about maybe developing some sub-dealer network, right? And, and it, it's a very important uh, point to make and a very important um, uh, you know, thing to relay uh, as you work on that to, to those guys that, you know, may be coming to you and they can prove to you that their sales experience is, is, is very impressive and they've been very good at what they did, right? But if it's a uh, product-based sales, you want to make sure that they 
uh, you know, the, the, the mindset is adjusted as they get into this type of service. So as the deal is closed, which is, you know, is, is definitely a great news to you, but in a way, this is just the start, right? Especially with as, as you grow your sub-dealer network, right? And, and, and understanding that and, and really building your operations around that mindset is extremely important, particularly if you're after the sub-dealer networks. Thank you. Excellent point, Sergey. Thank you. Thank you, Sergey. And I have a question uh, for you. Uh, so it's the first time when such type of presentation is presented to the international community. Uh, do you think this type of presentation can be used to train sales in the Americas? Yes, Dennis, please come. We <laughs> Thank you, Sergey. We are inviting you. Yeah, it's, it's, it's good stuff. Uh, it's, you know, a lot of we'll discuss my to, rider list later. <laughs> yeah, the, the really good fundamentals, absolutely. No, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And we have another question. Uh, I would just uh, wish to add something. Uh, first thing, thing, I was trained by American, and this is like completely okay. That's like, it, it could work. It will work for sure. Thank you. Uh, second thing, uh, regarding requirements gathering, I had some one interesting case that, that uh, could illustrate some situation that in process of sales of things like telematics, telematics is technology, uh, technology intensive thing. Uh, we would uh, more frequently be in position to be consultants than just to listen what those guys need. We had uh, one really specific case with really big company, uh, I don't know, seven, eight hundred vehicles, something like that. Uh, guys called us because of fuel. They wish to save money on fuel. But at the end, because uh, they had about 400 merchandisers working for them, result was that they increased fuel consumption after system implement because uh, those guys that should work their work was sitting in coffee shop and calling by phone and not visiting uh, customers. <laughs> and at the end, after we implement system for fuel saving, we spend more fuel for them. But uh, it's always better to solve issue that is uh, concerning business things uh, in operations than to fix for example, costs, fuel. If you hit the target in matter of their business, that is always more valuable than to hit the target in matter of costs. Yes, yes. Just wish to add exactly. that. Exactly, Ex excellent example. And the general idea is to see and to understand the business of your customer and what he really needs. Maybe he doesn't know it yet, but you can see it and you can provide an offer. And solution. from my experience, and I'm dealing with sales for 15 years, they usually do not know what they need. It's usually like that. Yeah. They, don't, they don't understand what is offering and what are our possibilities. And from my experience, two salespersons usually go there and just grab a piece of paper and write it down. What are the wishes and technical department trying to answer on that? But yes. they should be more advisors than uh, listeners in some situations. And you see, your example goes perfectly with uh, Sergey's point, because this is actually the key to upselling, because he came to you with something insignificant, but then you get there, you can see more, much more that you can do to help him to get a better result in his business, and this is actually he wants to achieve in the end. You want to be successful, right? And if you are a person to make that, this is a partnership never can... Uh, uh, yes, this is a great partnership. Okay, thank you, Milan. We have another question here on the third row. Um, <coughs> so, Denis, thank you very much for the presentation. I think it's something that we can pick and train our own salespeople because our salespeople are really our ambassadors. Uh, and the worst thing you can do is send a bad salesperson and ruin the relationship because that person will be fired, but the name of the company will remain. Uh, so I have one question and one comment. So I'll, I'll give you the comment first. I can't agree with you more on not giving up 
and know as being the first step of a, a long journey. So we had one example where we were approaching a company and uh, <coughs> he was interested and we gave him the best proposal uh, we could think of uh, and he declined. Uh, and in a not so polite way, but he just declined. But we kept in touch and we had a good uh, ERP that kept reminding us every two months to say hello and this and that. Um, <coughs> and almost four months later, he called me straight. He has never called me. I call him always. So it was good to know that he saved my number and that he called me by first name. He's like, I just submitted a tender and I won it. Uh, I, I said I have tracking, uh, but I don't. And I've won the tender. Uh, I have to prove now that I have tracking by tomorrow. Can you do it? It's 10 units. And I told him you can count on us. And today he has more than 190 trucks with us three generators, and all of his family cars. So this is a perfect example. When I told him you can count on me, that was just solidified the trust. So I uh, can't agree more with you that no is just the first step of a long uh, effort. My question is, <coughs> uh, I agree with the gentleman at the back when he says sometimes the customer doesn't know what they want. Uh, and, and in some cases, what we find is that we're giving more intelligence to the customer than they're able to handle. So uh, I'll give you a simple example. Uh, fuel theft. They give drivers uh, a lot of fuel to do very long distance trips from Tanzania to DRC. It's about 3,000 kilometers of driving. And they give all the fuel in one go. And every time they come back, they accuse the driver that you have, uh, that you, you have not accounted for 100 liters or 200 liters. Uh, and the driver uh, refuses, we go there, we show a lot of intelligence, and we come up with a verdict. He uses that verdict and he penalizes the driver and it's done. Uh, two weeks later, it's over and over and over again. And we keep doing this, and I'm beginning to think, what do you do as a sales process when you're giving more solution to the customer than the, solution, than the customer can handle? Yeah, in, in one case, I was telling him, why don't you just hire us and we'll manage your fuel. Yeah, but obviously that's, that's stepping into a completely different thing. Um, but what if he's not appreciating enough the amount of data that we can give him? Yeah, he thinks uh, we are proving to him your fuel is being stolen. He's almost not ready to accept. How do you get over that level of intelligence? Uh, let me clarify a bit more. The owner trusts us to the heart. It's the fuel dispenser guy who keeps having doubts over and over and over again. Uh, I, I believe some kind of a local politics uh, is in place because it uh, depends on relationships between this fuel uh, manager and drivers. Uh, I, I believe something around that and uh, if there's the case uh, well, it's kind of tough to handle, but uh, still it's possible to communicate, I believe, with a business owner, which uh, you can, uh, which trusts you, right? So maybe uh, you can create some automatic process of this uh, fuel management part, right? In order to him to get uh, reports beforehand, before actually driver and this manager came, claiming the system's wrong, right? This is what's happening, right? They claim system uh, wrong. Well, still, uh, it's up to this manager. But the question in general is a good one because sometimes, yes, it's quite hard uh, to communicate your uh, point to your customer because he might, uh, he doesn't understand. Well, uh, Generally speaking, I'd say that you get to speak to customer his language. Because yes, there's a big difference between, as I told, technician guys, sales guys, business owners, they are all professionals in their own spheres and they might not uh, understand each other that good. Uh, and why we are doing this preliminary research, why we are doing all this in order to understand him to be on his, in his place and to understand how he thinks and what he is uh, seeking to get. And maybe he is not seeking to get what you offer. 
that's possible too because uh, well uh, previous conference uh, there was an excellent case from Azerbaijan then customer refused to get a service and why well service was perfect they had a fuel economy and etc etc but somehow it appeared that uh, all persons involved are related and okay will stay somehow without this system. That's possible too. I don't think here you can win and provide them solution they, doesn't, they don't need, they don't want. Did I answer? Yeah. Thank you. Question. Oh, it's a tough question, but well, diff it's all in details as usual. Yeah, I think it's uh, important to analyse all, all the data, and like the, the gentleman here says, but uh, sometimes you can't actually get the, uh, the end user to actually do anything and implement anything. So what we're trying to uh, work on now is uh, to, to analyse, but more importantly, to have some uh, direct interaction between and interoperability between the telematics device and the actual vehicle. So uh, we can analyze that people are speeding and everybody does this and they come up with some analytics but typically people don't want to, you know, the driver won't change the driving habit. So uh, we're going to, we've developed now something that's worked with a Garmin but now it will work with a telematics interface over a RS232 uh, common protocol uh, to automatically limit the vehicle speed into the prevailing limit uh, depending on the GPS coordinates as well. Uh, so we're steering more towards that and, and uh, monitoring idling time as well, particularly on construction machinery um, where they can analyse the, uh, the idling time is excessive for using a lot of fuel and also running up hours which uh, in, you know, impacts upon the residual value of the machines sort of three years down the line uh, to actually cut the vehicle out as well in situations like that that you couldn't on a road going machine. You know? So uh, I think they're the important things because I think people are getting too much analysis but they don't have the time to implement it or able to do anything about it, you know, enforce it. This is a problem, you know? Uh, well, uh, I'd say that uh, it's up to us to provide the customer with information, right? But again, it's up to customer to make something with this information and to make something to change their driver's behavior. And well, here uh, if he maybe maybe he doesn't have time to on this, but again, if you uh, show the result, a possible result of these actions, well, maybe he is going to have some time for this, because uh, if, for example, you can show that he uh, loses a certain amount of money on a monthly basis, and in comparison, this his actually monthly earnings. Maybe it it's going to be a significant amount because in Russia sometimes uh, we manage to save as much as a couple of uh, tens of thousands uh, dollars per month with such a fuel vest situation. Well, it's kind of a rare case, but it, it is a true story. Uh, it was. Uh, around uh, 3 uh, million rubles per month. Uh, it's amount $50,000 uh, per month. Uh, it's a big entity, lots of vehicles, but they were able to prove thefts are in place and, well, they made something to stop it. Uh, in this case, you described why would they need a solution at all if they won't look there to check the data. They spend some time to implement it, I believe. If we uh, you know, kind of uh, analyze it, that's important. But the important thing is that, uh, you know, what the end result is in terms of how you're getting the change, you know. So if we analyze the driver behavior, uh, then, you know, obviously we need an outcome from that that, you know, makes the change. But uh, routinely, you know, I think that uh, we need to see more through devices that actually control the machine or the vehicle uh, so we don't need this kind of interaction between the driver to you know rely on them to actually make the change you know we can do it all automatically automate the process uh, to control the, the vehicle or the machine you know 
so uh, and how we gonna make him to for example uh, break uh, less harshly or uh, <laughs> you understand my point right uh, well I believe it can be done but maybe implementing such a solution would be even more expensive uh, right when to have just rating system for drivers and some uh, financial cuts for them. But yes, that's the way to go. It's like a future, 21st century and <laughs> and forth. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I think we have no time, no more time for questions. If it's a quick one, let's make it a qu quick one. Uh, hello, yes. Um, just a quick uh, observation and uh, you know, experience in what I dealt with uh, mainly in Asia, Middle East and Africa. Uh, a lot of my uh, customers are in areas where they have poor you know, or inadequate coverage. And a lot of times the number one requirement that we get for telematics is we want real-time tracking. We want up to the second, uh, you know, uh, tracking and, and things like that. Which, you know, without going in depth into understanding what the customers and engaging them, we first we ask them. I said, why do you want to have real-time tracking? Are you running a Uber service that you need to know exactly where you want? They says, no, we don't even have people in a control room to look at the screens. So you know, they would give us a very simplistic. Uh, kind of uh, requirement of real-time tracking. But what essentially they want is, you know, the data analytics that comes back to know about engine idling, about, you know, um, machinery efficiency, whether it's working or not, about fuel theft and, and things like that. So a lot of times what we get, you know, may, may, may not exactly be what the customer wants because they don't know what they want. And you know, just because they think that telematics equals real-time tracking, they will specify that as a requirement of real-time tracking. But how many companies do you know that has got a control room with people sitting there and looking at a map of where their vehicles are? What they want is actually historical data of, you know, and the data analytics that comes out of it to help them improve operational efficiency, business operation, and things like that. And that requires you know, a level of engagement, you know, to talk to them, to educate them. I think that's, uh, you know, a lot of the uh, observation that we get from the kind of request that we see, you know, and without engaging further, it's very difficult to then sell the solution to the customers because they don't know what they want. Excellent point, thank you. And it looks like that you already have kind of ready-made solution how to deal with most of your customers, what to offer them. Right? Absolutely, yes. And the repose in some convenient way to see what's going on and what they have to do with it. That too. Yep, yes, yes, sure. Well, but sometimes uh, e even e if you just told uh, this driver that he has a little camera in cabin, maybe he gonna believe that someone watching him constantly. <laughs> okay, yeah. thank you for your questions and thank you for your answers, Dennis. It w were really great insights. And uh, let's give him another round of applause for this great presentation. Thank you.